Okay, so today we're going to talk about the material covered in chapter three of the textbook. Um, it's a material that's often called non-associative learning, um, which will be in contrast to the associative learning that we'll describe in the next couple of weeks. And in particular, three forms of non-associative learning, habituation, sensitization, and familiarization. So we'll start by talking always about behavioral processes and in particular discuss some of the different forms of non-associative learning. So we frequently encounter the same stimuli day after day from the same contacts, the same locations, the same classes. And most organisms, including people, learn automatically about things that we frequently encounter. And that we learn in three particular types of ways. We learn from habituation, which is decreasing responses to a frequent but innocuous stimulus. Sensitization, which is increasing responses to a noxious or arousing stimulus and perceptual learning, which becomes better at processing or recognizing a frequent stimulus. And these are the three types of non-associative learning that we're going to talk about here. So let me just give you, show one here. That's not very promising. Why is it not happening? Mm, okay. So let's figure out why that's not working. So habituation is a decrease in the strength or occurrence of the behavior due to repeated exposure to the stimulus that produces the behavior. An example is the acoustic startle response, and it looks like this. So there's a, a, a rodent, mouse, or rat, I can't tell, okay? There's a bell, okay? Okay, so there's a bell, it, it, it knows the bell and it's startled. That's the, the rat kind of flipping over. That's the test one. Then test two, okay, there, there it goes. There we've got the sound. Um, oh, you know, we didn't bring the speakers. Um, the, uh, and so now you see that by the second time it's seen it, it doesn't respond. It responds a little bit. You see here, it, it got startled partway. That's sort of, it's rotating around. And finally, when we keep doing this, eventually it hears it and it doesn't respond at all. And it just it doesn't care. So what's happening is this stimulus that's not particular, it's a neutral stimulus, but yet you kind of startled by it. You want to try to figure out what it is in a sense. Okay. So the behaviorist defines habituation as a decrease in the behavior. We don't really care about what the rat is thinking. Okay. Um, and this then sort of allows a, a measure of what's happening in this. I'm going to Okay, so you saw what was sort of illustrated there. Sort of frustrated that all my, all my embedded videos are not working. So here, this should be the next video. So, you want to describe? You're, you're our, our baby expert. What, what, what were we seeing there? I'm not necessarily a baby expert, but I'm thinking that at first she was interested and then it's right. like... Right, so, so, so it tunes out. So it's just like the rat that you know, initially it pays attention and you know, there isn't so much a starter reflex, but sort of an orienting reflex looking at it and so forth. So in both, mm -hmm. in both cases... Um, so let me go back here. The, uh, so one of the things about habituation is that it can be quantified 
There's this acoustic startle reflex, which is the amplitude. So sort of they're measuring you know, the rat's movement. Um, this is sort of fixation time in, in babies and the orienting. And what you can see is that, you know, is that the response is sort of declining in both cases. Okay? And that eventually one sort of stabilizes at a sort of a minimal, minim minimal or non-existent startle orientation. So some of the characteristics of habituation, the first is that it's ubiquitous. It's found throughout the animal kingdom in all species. Even single-celled organisms can show forms of habituation. Um, there are striking similarities in how it works. Uh, there's dishabituation, and I'll, I'm going to describe what all of these are. So there are a number of paradigms, way, a aspects, of manipulations of habituation, which you can see consistently across a wide variety of animals. And I'll, just, I'll show you some of these here. Okay? So we'll look at each of these in terms. Actually, so I don't think we actually need that because the sounds are, we'll wait till there's a movie or something, but I think it's, you can actually hear this enough. Okay, I'm not sure how well that illustrated it. Does anyone? So, right. So the idea of dishabituation um, is when you've extinguished something, and then something else novel happens, and what that something else that novel occurs creates a sort of a, a renewed um, at paying attention to cues that you might have habituated to before. Okay, so let me just describe, just go back to here. I don't know why this was working before. So some characteristics of dishabituation. Um, so what happens here is you start with habituation, okay, and then in dishabituation, a novel or arousing stimulus, that was that other thing that happened, can temporarily recover responses. So here, there's a different noise. So you habituate to a particular noise, you differentiate to it, and then the old noise comes back, and where previously you had habituated to it, there's now responding. Um, and then this, can, this fades quickly. So it gives you sort of a transient recovery from the habituation, okay? And we'll come back to this, um, because then, it, repeat, then, then it, it comes, you know, it goes back very rapidly to habituate. So it doesn't actually bring you back to where you were here, but in fact, it's just sort of like a temporary reorients to it. So another aspect is stimulus specificity, um, which means that responses tend to only to decrease the habituating stimulus. So it's not a general tuning out of everything, but rather if you have this different noise, which we used before to dishabituate, but if we keep presenting this different noise, um, again, spontaneous recovery, okay, I'll go back here. Um, what happens is that it's th the habituation is just to the stimulus that you were trained on, so a very different noise you start all over again. So it's, it's, it's specific to the stimulus that was habituated. So you're tuning out not everything, but just what you saw. Okay. the animal sort of recovers a bit. So what does that suggest about the habituation? If you recover after a day or a few, if you recover somewhat after a few days? What? Yeah, but what else? What's another way of saying that it's... Yeah, but there's another thing that might be going on, which is that it might also be very, it suggests the habituation may be very context sensitive. That, it, that if the temporal context changes, um, then you may recover some of it. I don't know why, I, I uploaded, I, 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 most, Muhammad, I added all these videos to be embedded and they were working before and now suddenly they're not, I don't know why. So that was spontaneous recovery. The idea is that when a repeated stimulus stops, then the behavior gradually re returns to normal. Okay, so it tends to be a short term, one hour break, 
You see it comes back. Another break, comes back again. So it suggests that, this, that habituation is a, a short-term phenomena primarily. Okay. Um, there are various ways that you can habituate, short-term versus long-term. More repetitions of the stimulus, you get longer-lasting habituation. Okay. And with many, many repetitions, it can become relatively permanent. So you can see that every day you come back, you've recovered a bit, that's the spontaneous recovery, but if you do it over and over again, you've tuned the whole thing out by day four. Okay, but how this habituation happens, and by the way, I'm describing, this is just sort of studies from rats, but one of the things that's so interesting about these phenomena of habituation sensitization is that you see them from small invertebrates up through humans, and these characteristics, these kinds of paradigms of spontaneous recovery, dishabituation, are co fairly constant in their general characteristics. So one of the issues is massed versus spaced, something that comes up when you think about testing and training. If you take breaks between each session, okay, of repeated stimulus, it makes the habituation go more slowly initially, because after each break, you're, you're losing some of it, but it makes it more permanent and it lasts longer. So it suggests that if you want to rapidly habituate something, do it all at once, bang, 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 bang. If you want it to last, you want to space it out with time. So you essentially want to let that spontaneous recovery occur so you can then habituate out that spontaneous recovery. Okay, and that also works for studying as well. You know, you study a lot of new material. You know, we're habituating, it also works for studying. So some other characteristics is the weaker the stimulus, the more the habituation. Okay, if we keep playing a fire alarm here, it's gonna take a long time till you habituate that. You know, a small little clicking or a ticking or something, you're, you're more likely to habituate that. The stronger the stimulus, the less habituation. So a louder noise shown up there shows relatively little habituation. And a painfully loud noise, we see does the opposite. You actually see an increase, and we'll talk about that later. Okay, so it's really critical that it be a relatively neutral, non-aversive uh, stimulus, something that you orient to because you think it might be relevant, um, and eventually learn to tune it out. And one way of thinking about this from an engineering perspective is this is not a system, you know, this, this unlearning is not a bad thing. You know, the fact that is that it's a good way, it's the way that we tune out weak and useless stimuli in the world so that we can focus on things that are relevant. Um, on the other hand, something that's sort of itself inherently noxious, um, then we see sensitization. And I'll talk about sensitization in a minute. But so just to summarize, habituation is ubiquitous. It's found throughout the animal kingdom. Across of all organisms, we see very common types of phenomena that occur. And this is a conserved mechanism. Conserved is the term that means that it's found throughout the animal kingdom. It's sort of conserved by evolution. Um, and uh, the question is, what about the stimuli that one does pay attention to? So let me talk for a minute. Let's just take a, a break here and talk a little bit about we, what we've just learned. So we have Valentine's Day coming up in a few days. Um, so imagine Valentine's Day is coming up. Many years you've been with your partner. The relationship has lost some of the spark. You'd like to do something that revives some of the romantic and sexual spark in the relationship. So I want you guys to suggest some Valentine's Day ideas to rekindle a sort of a, a relationship that rely on dishabituation and spontaneous recovery. Okay? Somebody want to suggest how to, a, a Valentine's Day uh, advice for uh, dishabituation? Sending flowers, that would be... Okay. And why is that a dishabituation? Oh, that's not dishabituation. Wait, yeah, if you're getting into the habit of not really uh -huh. celebrating each other and giving a little gift, that would... So doing, some, doing something unexpected. Uh huh. So dishabit so dishabituation, just recall, is when there's something that you've become familiar with that you've lost interest. So let's just say that's your partner. Okay. So you've you've become habituated to your partner. Okay. They're no longer you no longer noticing them. You no longer them. You see them every day. Okay. So we see that you, your sort of arousal response has gone down. So now, what happens in dishabituation? Remember the what was the remember? There's a, something else which is novel, okay? Which is paired with the stimulus you've habituated. Okay? So any other thoughts? What could you, what, what's another way you could apply 
dishabituation to rekindle a romance. Exactly. Okay. So do okay. the flowers work? Well, no, because what you want to be doing in, in dishabituation, you're taking the habituated stimulus, your partner, and you're pairing it with something novel, which causes you to sort of pay attention not just to the novel stimulus, but to the partner. Because remember, it, the, the novel stimulus caused the rat to pay attention to the sound, which it had tuned out. Right. So Donald's idea of go to a new place, going on a vacation. Want to rekindle the romance, go on a vacation? Um, if you look in our book, we have a sidebar that's called Sex on the Beach. Okay, and the implication there is if you've lost the sexual spark, um, go somewhere else to have sex. Okay, because the novel context is essentially the dishabituation, the, you know, the other stimulus, which is novel, which causes you, the, the point is not to make them pay attention to the flowers, but to pay attention to you, or you to them. Okay, so you want to present the habituated stimulus, the partner, in a novel context, on the beach or on vacation. And but I'm paying attention to the beach if I'm at the beach. Well... Not if you're having sex on the beach. <laughs> but we don't need to go too much details. But the main point is, the main point is you're not that you're sort of distracting them, is that you're, 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 present, you're taking the stimulus that's been habituated and you're presenting it in the context of preceded by something novel. Okay? All right. Sima, you want to tell us spontaneous recovery? What? Sima, sorry. So how could you rekindle romance with spontaneous recovery? Well, so let's think about the spontaneous recovery is the tone, the tone, the tone, the tone, you eventually tune it out, then you wait a few days and co response comes back. Okay? I'll give you a hint. Shakespeare, I think Shakespeare had some advice here. Absence, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Okay? So maybe the, roman maybe the romance that you've habituated, maybe what you need to do is say, look, I'm going to go away for two weeks. I'll be back on Valentine's Day. Okay? So you allow for some spontaneous... Uh, recovery after two weeks of absence, you'll become much more of a novel stimulus. Okay? So, so what is sensitization? It's an increase in the strength or occurrence of a behavior to something that's arousing or noxious. So unlike in habituation where we're talking about something, a click, a sound, something that doesn't impair us, sensitization is usually with a, a, a much more salient stimulus, something which can actually be annoying or even noxious. So acoustic startle, Okay, so remember the acoustic startle was where the rats were playing this a tone that you startle and eventually you tune it out. So here is an example. So test one, you play this, uh, this, this sound. I don't know if I get any noise, okay. No sound here. Then you present a, um, the tone, but right before the tone you shock the animal. Okay, okay. Rat's been shocked. And now you present the tone, okay, and it does a backflip. So the idea here is that between the first test and the second test, you shock the rat. So it's just like before, we presented a tone, but rather than habituation, by having shocked the animal beforehand, we cause it to overreact, okay, or, or the opposite of habituation. Okay, and so the idea here is that because there's been this very noxious thing happening, that's sort of aversive, it's made you hypersensitive to things you might have tuned out. So can anyone think of some exam real world examples? If you see that there's like a spider crawling on your arm, mm -hmm. may, and, you, and you flip it off, you may feel like any little breeze, there's like another spider on your arm. Right. That's a good example. So exactly. So, so let's say you saw, you saw a spider, you kind of freaked out, okay? And then afterwards, I came up and I just went a bit like that. You go, ah, you know, there's a spider or something. It's just because you become sort of hypersensitized to, to stimuli that otherwise you might tune out. You see um, this a lot with children who are abused. Exactly. When so you raise your hand, you might just end them. Exactly, trigger. exactly. So this is, this is very much a model of what you often see in sort of abuse and trauma, where, you know, there's so much, um, you know, there's so much sort of trauma, like being shocked, that... There's a, an overreaction to, to stimuli that other children might tune out or habituate to. Okay. So again, one of, the, one of the properties of sensitization is that it can be quantified and studied. Um, so initial habituation, the animals settle to some stable baseline. Okay, so we do a habituation. We get them to a stable point of essentially tuning out a stimulus. Okay, and then you apply the foot shock here. 
and then you'll see an overall responding to the, to the little tone afterwards. The idea is you present tone, 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 the animal tunes it out in a standard habituation, okay? But if on one of the group, the experimental group, right before the last tone test you shock it, then of course it responds to the shock, that, that, that's standard. That's not a learned response, that's an innate response. But the point is after it's been shocked, the next time it sees the tone, it jumps back. So this would be like a child, you know, who's been, you know, sort of beaten often, where you might raise your hand, which is sort of like a neutral stimulus, the child sort of jumps back because it's sort of overall sensitized to anything, you know, that could be significant, you know, indicative of a threat. Um, and my, I, I believe, and I don't know the literature, that this sort of, a, this sensitization is probably also a good model, probably used in animal models of anxiety disorders, this sort of this hypersensitive, hypervigilance. Mohammed, do you know anything about that? No, oh, okay. So let's talk about some of, again, the characteristics of sensitization. Again, it's ubiquitous. Um, it shows a number of characteristics, which we'll discuss in detail. There is, again, spontaneous recovery, and there are short and long forms. So we see the sort of a mirroring of habituation. Um, noxious or painful stimuli work better than weak stimuli. And the, there's more generalization and less stimulus specificity. So the point is, um, we saw that for habituation, if I habituate you to a tone of, say, a certain frequency, all right, and you habituate to it, and then I play a tone of a slightly different frequency, you may pay attention to that, okay? So the habituation is very specific to the tone, the particular frequency of the tone. On the other hand, with, sens with sensitization, what you're seeing is sort of a global arousal that may generalize to lots of things, so that if you sensitize the animal with a shock, it's not specific to any particular tone. It's, it's every, all, all the sort of stimuli that it might see it becomes hypersensitive and responding to. Um, and you can develop with just a single noxious stimulus like the shock that we saw right there. Um, and uh, the idea behind it is that it's a conserved mechanism, again, you know, something we see throughout the animal kingdom, to increase responses to stimuli that are important. So habituation and sensitization are all about the, the sort of the innate mechanisms by which we learn to tune out what isn't relevant and tune out what is relevant. Now why do you think, so it's, it's clear why, we might, why habituation, if something happens over and over again and nothing's following it, we might want to tune it out because we don't want to pay attention to things that have a history of not predicting anything good or bad. Why would it make sense if you've been shocked to pay attention to the next thing that you see, like a tone, even if you've already seen in the past that the tone is irrelevant? What's, what, what would be the the adaptive value of that. Right? Right, you want to avoid the shock again, you're sort of sensitive to anything that could be possibly predictive of it. You know, so it sort of, sort of, it sort of puts you into a hypervigilant mode to look for clues that will allow you to predict and avoid future aversive stimuli. And this is why in trauma, in abused children or otherwise, you sort of see these kinds of behaviors. So let's compare sensitization and habituation. So habituation decreases behavior, sensitization increases behavior. Habituation usually involves an innocuous stimulus, sensitization a noxious stimulus. A single, repeated exposure is critical to habituation. Um, in sensitization, a single trial helps, but you can have more, as in repeated trauma. Um, it's very, st uh, habituation is stimulus specific, it's exactly that tone. Sensitization generalizes. And these two, they seem like sort of opposite phenomena, but research both at the behavioral level and the biological level suggests that in fact they occur in parallel. And the dual process theory, Groves and Thompson in 1970, suggested that habituation and sensitization reflect different activation of two different systems. A low threshold reflex pathway, which uh, weakens with repeated use, and a high threshold state system that when activated increases responses globally. So the idea globally gives you a uh, the lack of stimulus specificity, okay? Um, and the reflex pathway suggests, so the idea here is that there's a st stimulus, sensory neuron, motor neuron, and response, that this is gonna habituate normally by repeated use, but if it's sufficiently sort of noxious um, with a high threshold that it, it uh, sensitizes everything, then you'll see an increase in responding not only to this stimulus, but to other stimuli. So that was 1970, that was the beginning of some of the sort of the behavior, you know, the, the, the neuroscience. They are trying to understand how these two behaviors might be operating in parallel. Um, 
And the idea is the weak stimulus is primarily a reflex pathway activation. It's stimulus specific. The noxious stimulus um, will create a, re a reflex. You'll have whatever the reflex is, for example, to the shock. But then you'll globally change the state of the system so that there's a, a heightened uh, increase in responsiveness. And with a moderate stimulus in between, you'll get a combination of the two. So they were arguing that these aren't necessarily two alternative phenomena, that you're doing one or the other, but in fact both are taking place all the time um, under similar mechanisms. And depending on the frequency and the salience of the stimulus, one or the other is going to predominate. Um, so that's sort of sensitization. Any questions about sensitization? Any thoughts about examples? I don't have an apply it apply what you know here, but if I had an apply what you know here, what, what might it be? What's an example of sensitization? We've talked about abused children and trauma. Any other real world examples? No? Okay. Sounds like a good quiz question for next week. Okay. So another way in which we see non-associative learning is altered processing. So repeated stimulus does more than just alter your reflexes. It can alter your familiarity and your ability to process that stimulus. Um, a number of these types of altered processing that we see is perceptual learning, so repeated experiences with a set of stimuli improve your ability to distinguish those stimuli. And it can occur both with directed training, discrimination training, as well as just by being exposed. That is, that the more you're exposed to stimuli, even without being trained that one is rewarded, one is punished, you become familiar with them, you, you increase your ability to process them. We see altered responses to stimuli that have previously been encountered, so sort of familiarity. And we see priming, which is a, when exposure to a stimulus at one point biases future behavior, often without conscious processing. Okay? And I'm going to discuss now each of them in turn. So perceptual learning, what often happens is, let me see here. So simply encountering a stimulus makes it increasingly easier to tell it apart. So participants will view a target scribble, that's this scribble here, um, and uh, they then later on try to pick it out of a deck of other similar scribbles. And even if you don't give people feedback um, on this, so it's not like you're telling them whether they're getting it right or wrong, just the very act of processing the stimulus um, makes it easier and faster. So you get better and better at doing something even without feedback because you're familiar with it. So you've effortlessly learned many things. So that, for example, the difference between Coke and Pepsi, McDonald's fries or Wendy's fries, et cetera, you know, as you become familiar with these things, you begin to pay attention and recognize the difference. So the idea is that um, you'll, you'll learn, sometimes by discrimination learning, to really be able to tell the difference between a, a Coke and a Pepsi after a lot of experience, even if initially they may taste the same. So another chance to sort of step outside the lab. So let's talk about um, perceptual learning. Okay, so the idea behind perceptual learning is that the more familiarity we have with a stimulus, the more deeply we process it, the more we, we are able to make fine-grained distinctions and discriminations and recognition. So how do you think this might contribute to racial bias? So what's an example of racial bias which might reflect, one aspect of racial bias which might reflect spatial learning and perceptual learning? Like the example you gave in the book? Aha, imagine where I got that from. Okay, someone want to talk, want to explain what that is? I'm trying to form it and Okay. Is any, anybody else? The, the, more, the more often, or the more time you spend with different racial groups, the easier it is for you to distinguish between them as if, if they D were... Distinguish between them or within them? Or distinguish within them. Right. Uh -huh. so So there's an, an oft-repeated, you know, uh, racial statement is, oh, they all look alike, you know, blacks, whites, whatever, Chinese, they all look alike, okay, which is often taken as being sort of a derogatory and racist, but it also actually describes an element of truth in terms of cognitive processing, which is, if we're not familiar with someone from another race, um, then first of all, when we see them in the context of mostly in our race, you don't need to process very deeply, oh, that's obviously so-and-so, because there's one very salient stimulus which differentiates them from everybody else, so you don't need to process it more deeply. And if you don't have a lot of experience, then you just sort of recognize it as a sort of group whole. And one of the ways that can contribute, as opposed to a, 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 
a race that you're familiar with, you become much more sensitized to the differences. Okay? And so there really is an element of they all look alike, which is true, and which also represents familiarity. It also makes it harder to, you know, one of the big issues in, in, in racial bias is the tendency to confuse what might be true of a group versus an individual. So there are many generalizations about a group, okay, which are true and based in a certain statistical fact, but they don't apply to everybody. So being able to be sent, a big part of sort of stepping outside of racial bias is to be able to be both aware of group means and averages and tendencies, but also to be able to recognize that it doesn't apply to everybody and that an individual may be different, okay? Not every Korean has a tiger mom, you know, who pushes them to study 10 hours a week and so on and so forth. So the more you can sort of are sensitive to the individual differences, um, the, more, uh, the more able you are to sort of perceive and reflect and, and relate to someone as an individual. Two? I was just going to say that it also happens naturally in development, and it's called perceptual narrowing. Uh -huh. So at eight to nine months old, babies um, are no longer, they're better at discriminating faces of their own race uh -huh. versus those of so. Of others. Uh -huh. Also with native and non-native sounds. Uh -huh. So it's, it's kind it's of a natural process. Exactly. So any ideas how this, how perceptual learning can suggest ways to counter this? Could this be like coming to a campus like ours where you get exposed to a little bit of everybody because right. your environment is exposure to all different right. ways? Right. So a, a, key, a key part of, of perceptual bias is sort of exposure. Can you so and another example of that, um, that second answer is um, with, with auditory sound, so exposure to multiple languages during earlier ages um, can help yeah, the, the same kind of diversity. But if you're saying, like, if a baby say a baby is adopted by a family that's not the same race that they are, are they able to tell the difference? Like, do they have that concept of spell? Depends on when the child was adopted. Right. So, for example, there was an example. So, if if a black child is adopted into a white family, they're going to become much more perceptive of sort of individual differences, you know, among Caucasians. They're so not looking in the mirror. It's not a self. You know, it's it's about what they're looking at all the time, where they're communicating with and getting their emotional responses. From. Okay. So. Um, Perceptual learning can also occur from actual explicit discrimination training. So here's a discrimination training with feedback. One can learn very subtle differences. You'd be surprised at how well one can learn with loss of exposure. So here's a sample. Okay, one second. So I have a little bit of a one minute delay. I'm not gonna wait an entire minute, okay? So imagine you see that same as one minute delay. Now I ask which of these two match the one you just saw, okay? And there's only the difference, th th there's the one you saw and there's it rotated one degree, that's one out of 360 degrees, okay? It seems almost impossible, I'm sure nobody here could do better than chance, but in fact with feedback, if you train people on this, with feedback you can get people to do quite well. Um, and in fact this is the match, all right? So it seems almost impossible, but there are all sorts of things which people with repeated examples do. Um, actually Maggie Shafrar, many of you know, she's a professor in psychology, um, and she's now a dean. Uh, she's famous or infamous for a study she did in graduate school on chicken sexers. Okay, chicken sexers are people who pick up a baby chicken, turn it upside down, look at the genitals, and say whether it's a male or female. Turns out that that's kind of like this versus this when you're talking about a one week old chick. But there are these people, but it can be done, and there are these people who've been trained, you know, over months and years to sex these chickens, um, and it's about as hard as this and yet they do it. So she studied that as an example of perceptual learning. Okay. Um, one of the things about these kinds of perceptual learning, um, this is actually the, 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 the stimuli we just showed you, not the chicken sexing, um, is that it's very specific, okay? So if you're trained to do ch chicken sexing, then if it then pig sexing or something else, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't generalize, it's a very specific. So whatever's going on, is very specific to the stimuli that you're being trained on. Another form of, of uh, familiarity learning is called priming. So, so in priming, this is a, a very common type of paradigm used in the learning literature. You expose participants to some priming stimulus. So you prime them with initial exposure, which can either be with or without explicit processing. Um, and then 
later on you re-expose the stimulus or a partial stimulus. So people want to complete this step. So, so a typical one is you have words where you give people the first few letters. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to pass out some cards here so people we can actually do this without interfering with other people. So you should, everybody should take take some cards. So I want everyone to take to, to, to complete. Let me just pass those around. Just just pass it on. So just write down a word that begins with M O T and a word that begins with S U P. Everyone done? Okay. You want to just read them out, Sue? What were yours? Mother and support. Motel and supreme. Um, mother and supreme. Motel and supreme. Okay. Mother and supper. Okay. Motel and supper. So some of you say, who said supreme? Some, okay. So you're actually the one person who my experiment worked on. So I don't know if many of you remember, but the first few slides, um, there was the word moth supreme was sort of written in the corner, like a little bit of graffiti, okay, on the first couple of slides, and it wasn't related to anything. I didn't discuss it, and I didn't mention it, okay. So that was sort of a, I was subliminally priming you with those words, okay, um, and uh, that sound I just heard. Uh, and so the idea was that moth and supreme are fairly uh, unusual words. Um, so if you've been primed, you're much more likely to say moth and supreme. So with a subconscious priming. Um, and what I should have asked you is why did you say supreme? You know, and maybe if you really had been primed, you wouldn't, might not know it. You might try to come up with some post hoc explanation. It's because, you know, I watched, I love Diana Ross or something. But in fact, what really happened is that you were subliminally primed by me, which just shows that if you can choose which subject to report, you can actually get great results if you throw out all the data from the other ones. Do you remember seeing those? I actually don't. Okay. Um, well, these are, these are words that are much, so, so in general, when you do stem completion, it's word frequency which is, determines the likelihood. You know, the more frequent a word is, the more likely you are to recall it. If you prime people, then you can alter that um, subliminally, okay? So it's a subtle but, but reliable effect, um, and it can often work without conscious recall. So, Priming has many applications within psychology and in the real world. So you may have remembered there was one of the people we talked about uh, last week who uh, um, wound up having a, a scandalous affair, being driven out of academia, and then going into academia and then going into advertising and changing the world of advertising. You remember who that was? Who is it? Who is it who had a scandalous affair, got driven out of academia, and then wound up? getting lots more money and revolutionizing the field of advertising. But there's an associative uh, reason. Okay, it was James Watson. Okay. Okay. It was James Watson. So one of the things that James Watson did is he brought all sorts of concepts and paradigms um, for affecting learning and memory. Because if you think about what is advertising is all about memory. It's, it's about responding. It's about you want to remember a particular brand with a positive association and be more likely to choose it in the future. So um, can you think of a way in which priming um, might uh, be used in advertising? Or a psychic, someone who claims sort of extra, extra sort of powers might use priming? How about advertising? Maybe that's the easier one. What's an example of priming and advertising? I mean, is, it, is it sort of the base of advertising itself that, say, you look at a billboard and say it's something for Pepsi, and then you know you think of a soda and you think of Pepsi. And the next time you're in the supermarket, you go by the aisle that says soda and you think of Pepsi. All right. So in other words, if you're showing an advertising that shows people who are thirsty, you know, then drinking Pepsi, then even if you don't remember the commercial. Sometimes when you're thirsty, you do the stem completion. Thirst means I want a Pepsi. Okay, and even if you're not conscious of why you want, think you want a Pepsi, 
you've sort of built up this association. What about psychics? Okay. Psychics who read your mind? Any thoughts about how that might, uh, how you might, how you might convince people? Okay. So for example, So they'll often try to prime you. So for example, I could have claimed to be a psychic, okay, that I'm going to predict that someone in this room is going to complete SUP with Supreme, okay? And I sort of predicted this because I'm Mark the Magician, uh, but in fact I had sort of primed you so that there will be at least one of you, hopefully, who would have fallen for my trick, okay? So these are ways in which you sort of, by manipulating the unconscious, either in advertising or in a sort of a, a fake psychic, that you can take advantage of some of these phenomena to manipulate or predict people's behavior. So the next uh, phenomenon is categorical priming. So um, to explain this, we're going to do a little experiment. So I want you to try, so everyone put away your pens and pencils. Okay, I'm going to tell you 15 words that I want you to remember, okay? Sour, candy, sugar, Bitter, good, taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda, chocolate, heart, cake, Tart, pie, okay, that was 15. So how many do you think you could recall? So you don't, don't write them down now, that's not quite. Of, of those, how many think you could recall? If I just asked you to say them, just, just estimate. Okay, now if I showed them to you, if I showed you those words, those 15 words, let's say I mixed up 30 words, 15 that were from the list, 15 not, do you think you could recognize the words? How many of those do you think you could do right? Okay. Now let's see if this works here. So we're, we're congruent. Another concept you interest to, uh, introduce us to in here is the whole notion of priming. Mm -hmm. That is that what kind of is, is put in our head uh, yeah. can again structure our, our behavior, our, our output. Yeah. Describe that in a little bit more detail and give us some examples. Well these are these incredibly, they are spooky experiments that have been done um, in recent years, presumably by a guy at New York University called John Barge. He gives you a test to do, and it's a series of words, and you have to take each these sets of words and make sentences out of them. Really simple. What you don't realize, unless you're really, really, really smart, is that all these lists of words are on a similar theme. So suppose that I do, suppose the theme of all these sentences is um, old age. So those words like Florida, shuffleboard, arthritis, you know. Then... That was a little bit of a, we're going to watch half of that. Now we're going to go back to the lecture. Hold on. Okay, so now we're gonna, now that was just a little bit of a distraction. Talk about priming. So now, oops. Okay, so now I was distracting you for a bit. You thought we were, we thought we finished that. So now I'm going to go back, and we're going to go through the words that I, I'm going to go through. We're going to do a recognition test, not a recall test. And I want everyone, if there's a word that was on the list, okay, I want you to raise your hand, not look at me, not look at the other people, and if the word was not on the list, I want you to keep your hand down, okay. So, which of the following words were on the list? Okay, dog, house, candy, dog, tooth, pie, tomato, fast, Sweet. Hop, hold your hand right there, okay? So you guys all had a false memory syndrome implanted in you. You are really susceptible. I'm gonna, they're definitely going to give you a... So all the words on this list were all related to sweet, but sweet was not on the list, okay? Okay? So these are the studied words. As, as you all predicted, you, you know, on the studied words, you could do 100%, almost 100% compared to novel items. 
but this theme word, this word that was sort of categorically related to, to, to the list, but not on it, you had a huge number of false intrusions. Okay? So it suggests that we can be primed in such a way that we can imagine that we've seen things that we haven't. Okay? And there are actually some fascinating, that this paradigm, this false intrusion, uh, we'll come back to Malcolm Gladwell in a minute, where he's talking about it. Um, this study has also been studied as a way of people's source monitoring. How well do they know where they saw something? And it turns out if you look at people, for example, there was a, a very provocative study done at Harvard. Um, there was about 10 or 15 years ago, a whole lot of uh, reports of, of recovered, sort of recovered memories of childhood sexual abuse. So someone who's an adult, never thought they'd been abused, suddenly through therapy, through hypnosis, um, suddenly says, aha, now I know why I'm having trouble with relationships. Okay, when I was a child, I was abused by my father, my uncle, my neighbor, and I completely suppressed it for 20 years, and now it's just suddenly I've recovered this memory. And then they accuse the family, and there's a huge hullabaloo, and there's people go to jail, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole big bunch of this thing, this idea that, that you would have these repressed memories. And then it came out that a lot of these, and people initially were very accepted it. You know, someone's, they were so vivid, they were so sure, you know, they could describe in great detail. But then bit by bit it turned out that for various reasons it was clear that these, 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 had, these had to have been made up. You know, these people weren't lying on purpose, they generally believed of this. And so in one study were people who claimed to have had these recovered memories, so years of sort of repressed memories, uh, they claimed to have been released through hypnosis or, or, or therapy, versus a control group who had, who had actually had been abused and there had never been any doubt of it and they'd always remembered it and so forth. And what they found is that the group that had the, the sort of so-called recovered memory showed many, many higher intrusions relative to a normal group and an, on another version of this. Um, suggesting that that, gr that group, although no one knows, no, you, know, you can't go in and say they really were abused or were not, that group as a whole tends to have a much poorer source memory, that they're much more susceptible to believing that they've seen something um, than when it's actually occurred. So it suggests that there's sort of a, uh, an ability to sort of monitor the source that varies by individuals. So let me just go back for a second. Whoops, ouch. See the rest of... He measures how quickly you walk into the room when you come in to take the test, and he measures how quickly you walk out when you finish the test. And he finds that when you walk out, you s walk substantially slower than when you walked in. Because you've been thinking about because arthritis and old age. Yes. I have made your unconscious become obsessed with the subject of old age, and as a result, your unconscious has made you act old. Now, I can do this with, he does the same experiment, and he does it with words having to do with being polite. And then he puts you in a social situation that measures your patience and how polite you are. And he finds, for example, he did this thing where he had the students take the test, go down the hall, and you wa we want to give this to you. You have to give the test to some professor. But the professor is locked in conversation with someone else, and the question is, how long do you wait before you interrupt? If he primes you with words that have to do with polite, you'll wait forever. Mm -hmm. they, the kids were still waiting when they ended the experiment, like 10 minutes later. And if he primes you with words having to do with um, being rude, or, or you'll interrupt immediately. Now, some may think, well, these are frivolous little exercises, but the scariest one for me was mm -hmm. the one you talk about where African Americans, mm -hmm. one control group, was invited to state their race before they did an exam, yes. and the other was not. The one that was primed to think of themselves as, as African Americans, yeah. as blacks, scored much lower. Way, way, way lower. Yeah. What is the implications of this for something as fundamental as education, for example? Well, they're enormous. I mean, yeah. what they say is that, I mean, this goes to the theme of the book. If the theme of the book is there is more going on below the surface of consciousness than we tend to, tend to um, uh, realize, what this says is, is look, when you give someone a test, we think we like to pretend that what we're measuring is the kind of conscious contents of their brain. Mm -hmm. We're measuring something inherent, right, about how smart they are. We're not. What we are measuring, we're measuring some of that, but we are also powerfully measuring their state of mind at the moment they take the test. And to me, that completely undermines the notion, this naive notion that many educators have, that you can reduce someone's intelligence to a score on a test. You can't, right? Unless you are absolutely sure that you have ironed out and removed all those sources of bias, we have to accept the fact that a test is a deeply flawed instrument. It is a guide to... Okay. Anyway, so just a couple of examples from uh, the book. Who, who here read the book Blink? So um, let me just sort of summarize, then we're going to take a break because it's sort of the end of the behavioral. 
So animals learn from simple exposure to stimuli. Habituation is a decrease in responding to innocuous. Sensitization is increased responding. Uh, perceptual learning is learning to better and more rapidly distinguish stimuli. There are shared and distinctive features of these. Habituation is ubiquitous. Um, it has many different sort of characteristics, um, which you see at all animals. Many of them are shared with sensitization. Uh, perceptual learning it can occur through just mere exposure or through discrimination training, through learning specificity, through priming, through novel object recognition. All three may reflect some underlying approaches to processing information. I haven't talked about some of these theories. If you're interested in them, you can go back to the textbook and read through that. Um, so I'm going to take a break now. Um, why don't we take a break for 10 minutes until 20 of, and then we'll come back and we'll do the neural substrates and clinical perspectives. You want to cut the camera? Okay. So we're going to move now to the uh, brain substrates part of the lecture. Um, and the question is, what's going on in there? I guess in there meaning in the brain. So habituation, to recall, is a decrease in the strength or occurrence of behavior due to repeated exposure to the stimulus that produces the behavior. So here's the habituation. The, the rat eventually stops recognizing it. So how does the brain rat, how does the rat brain rewire so that the same stimulus that initially caused this now produces a different behavior? Okay, it's very hard to do in a rat. There are billions of neurons in a rat. Um, and here's another video that's not playing. Okay, so we're going to talk about, so it's hard to do in a rat, which is why people have been drawn to invertebrates. And... This sea snail, called a plesia, is somewhat of a celebrity, at least in the world of memory research. It was this lowly snail that revolutionized the way neurobiologists, like David Glansman, think of memory. But how do you give a snail a memory? We're going to give it a few shocks, but don't worry, it's not going to harm the animals. Okay. It's not going to produce any long-term damage. Wow. Giving it electrical shocks teaches the aplesia that the world is a dangerous place. How do we know it's actually learned? We look at a reflex. Touch the siphon of an aplesia, and it triggers a defensive withdrawal right reflex. Here. And I'm just going to touch the siphon like that. And there, there you is. see, that's the reflex. This reflex can tell scientists if the snail has formed the memory. The longer the gill and siphon remain retracted, that's an indication that it's learned, what we taught it. An aplesia that hasn't been given any shocks will respond with a short-lived contraction. There it's out. So, so what was that? 11, 11 seconds. seconds. All yeah. right. But an aplesia that was taught to be on guard responds much differently. Now there's the reflex. Now, point is that it stays tucked. So this guy's on a high state of alert here. Yeah, so you see he's, the siphon's just starting to come out now. And at 45, 45 seconds. seconds. So it's four times as long as the naive animal. Huh. And it's learned that there's a danger in its environment. That's Amazing. what it's learned. This learning is observed in its changed behavior. But scientists can also see signs of memory in Aplesia's legendary brain. Let's just say this sea snail is neurologically well endowed. It has very large, huge, some of the biggest neurons in the world. Its few but gigantic neurons inspired researchers to essentially create an aplesia mini-brain out of a sensory neuron and a motor neuron. We take those out of the animal and we put them into cell culture and they grow together and then we have a mini circuit, a neural circuit, Scientists can see, on a cellular level, what happens as the mini-brain forms a memory. So, what is happening? Basically, we see two things. The synapse between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron gets stronger. When the snail gets zapped with electricity, the neurons start communicating differently, sending more, stronger chemical signals and receiving more signals. This change, which can happen quite quickly, but doesn't last forever, corresponds to short-term memory. But administer the shocks over a longer period of time, and the two neurons physically change as the snail learns. Anatomically, we actually see the growth of new synaptic connections between the sensory and motor neuron. And it's this physical change in the neurons that is long-term memory. 
As the snail learns over time, its brain is making more and more connections, so that even when the snail gets a break from the shocks, it will still remember them. Besides training sea snails to be on a high state of alert, the research on aplesia has been integral in understanding learning and memory, and not just for snails. When you're looking at these changes in aplesia, you're basically looking at the bedrock of learning. Those same processes take place in our brains. And with the advancements in memory research that aplesia has already inspired, it is most likely going to remain in the spotlight for decades to come. So the Aplesia californica um, is also called the sea hare. It has only about 20,000 neurons, and they're very large, as you saw. And it's become popularized particularly by Eric Kandel, who we'll come back to in a few minutes at Columbia, sort of a predominant model for studying a lot of these basic mechanisms of learning and memory. Um, you saw here this gill withdrawal reflex in, in the video. Um, the basic idea is you touch the tail, and the gill contracts within the mantle and the time to the relaxation is measured. So that's the relaxation, meaning coming back out again. So the basic model is that there are sensory neurons for the siphon, the tail, and what's called the mantle. They go to a motor neuron, which is this gill withdrawal. And if you touch the siphon, or the mantle, that activity projects along and there's glutamate released, and you see an activity which then progresses to the gill muscles, and you see the withdrawal. That's like a little mini animation. The gill, and then the gill contracts. Okay, shown there and there. So in habituation, we see the gentle touch to the siphon. Again, this is like a neutral stimulus. It's like the tone that's played to the rat. It produces a gill withdrawal. The siphon is sort of embedded there within the gill. And you repeat the touch every minute for 10 minutes, and you get progressively shorter gill withdrawal. So this is the classic hab behavioral habituation that we saw before. It recovers quickly, but with many sessions becomes long-lasting. So all the same properties that we talked about earlier. So what are the mechanisms of habituation? We know the mechanisms of the activation, is what we just described here. Repeated touch depletes sensory neurons of transmitter. So it's called synaptic depression. So there's less and less glutamate. In sensitization, your gentle touch to the siphon we saw produces the gill withdrawal. But if you give an aversive shock to the tail, okay, that's like that big loud noise that we saw, the next touch is a much longer withdrawal. Okay, so the same basic idea that interspersing an aversive event gives you the opposite. Um, and it recovers quickly. So here, tail shock activates interneurons. And these interneurons globally sensitize all stimuli. And that's what gives us the lack of specificity, so that the habituation occurs along a particular sensory motor pathway. That's the specificity. The sensitization occurs through these interneurons, which globally um, sensitize all pathways. So some of the lessons from the habituation is habituation sensitization cause opposing changes in synapse function, depression versus facilitation, uh, causing weakening and strengthening. So it's very much like the embodiment of the Groves and Thompson model. Learning involves both direct changes in synapse function and modulation of their function. And with repeated training, there's actually rewiring. There can be, although I didn't describe it there, there can be addition or subtraction of synapses. And it's the addition of su subtraction of synapses which is what creates long-term permanent changes. So let me just go back to Eric Kandel. So the person who introduced all of this is Ka Eric Kandel. And there's a wonderful movie which we went to as a lab trip. Were you here when we did that, Mohammed? No, it was before you. Was so you were here. Um, so there's a wonderful movie that's based, in a sense, on Eric Kandel's Nobel, Pro no Nobel Prize speech, which was a mixture of his science and his scientific autobiography. You know, how he, how, both what he did and how he as a life came there. Um, and we went to see it. It's available, I'm sure, now on Netflix or something. Um, it's wo absolutely wonderful. 
This is just the trailer for that movie. If the people go and see this movie and they remember it the next day, that is because there will be an alteration in gene expression in their brain. So every single person in the audience watching this film has a slightly different brain because they have learned somewhat different things. We are who we are because of what we learn and what we remember. Memory is the glue that binds our mental life together. I mean, it makes it possible for me to remember what I did this morning, what I did last week, what I did six years ago. It is what allows us to get continuity in our lives. You look good for yourself too, man. What are you, about 82? I'm 40. <laughs> are you funny? 82. <laughs> My father thought that um, I would go to Hollywood. And here I am. That was really more of an advertisement for something that I'd encourage everyone who's interested to go find on Netflix or whatever. Yeah, it's a great book. Okay. So, let me just talk a little bit, wrap up, about perceptual learning. So perceptual learning we call it distinct from habituation. It involves repeated exposure to stimulus and leads to an improved ability to recognize or process that stimulus. Um, and how does this happen in the brain? And how does it process input? We know that one of the ways in which this happens is in the sensory cortices, that input from each sense is relayed to a specialized sensory cortex, such as the somatosensory cortex shown here. Each neuron in the sensory cortex has a receptive field, okay, distinct parts of the world that it responds to. So there might be a neuron that responds to touch from here to here, for example. Um, and receptive fields are organized into these sort of maps, so that if you, if you, if you go through the cortex, you'll see this sort of homunculus-like figure that's represented okay, in the sensory cortex. So that here, these neurons reflect the, the eye, the nose, the mouth, and so forth. So the idea is that the map of, of sensory cortex um, captures some of the sort of the physical similarity of the areas that they're responding to. Um, these maps are not fixed. Okay, they're plastic, so that so that with experience, these these uh, these maps change, and even modest practice can rewire. Um, so, and you see it with sustain with sustained practice, you see a tremendous amount of rewiring. So, an example is in uh, uh, bass players you know, who, who grasp the bow with one hand like this, but do an incredible amount of fingering here like this as they're playing. Um, if you, from functional brain imaging, you can actually see that there is far more sensory cortex devoted to their left fingers than to their right fingers, you know, because they've done 10,000 hours of practicing like this. So sort of one example of how the brain rewires. Um, and part of the ways in which this is believed to happen is by the principles of uh, heavy and plasticity, the idea that cells that fire together wire together, uh, which is a way of thinking of LTP, and cells that are out of sync lose their link, as in long-term depression. So that is that the more things that co-occur, the more they tend to be wired up together. And it suggests, again, coming back, we talked about Darwin early on in, in the previous lecture, that there are mechanisms much like natural selection. Okay? So if you imagine that that the neurons, you might start with the same number of neurons encoding all the fingers here, but then if you spend 10,000 hours practicing, these neurons that encode these fingers are sort of dying off because they're, they're not competing well. They don't, they're not getting a lot of stimulation. They're not being used a lot. Well, these neurons, there's a lot of uh, resources and they essentially compete in the environment, just like moths of two different colors might compete um, in a particular environment and the gray moths will survive and the white moths will die off. Um, the same kinds of processes, these sort of adaptive evolutionary processes are going on all the time with the neurons. And so these neurons, which, which, which uh, are much more critical to survival, um, to at least surviving in the, in the music world, um, are the ones that survive and take over more of the sort of the environment to, to, to encode the left hand. Fewer the neurons survive for the right hand because they're not as critical for survival. So again, we see these principles of evolution coming back um, and helping us understand 
sort of the ecosystem of the brain. So let me summarize for the brain substrates. The study of simple organisms, especially the aplesia, show that both sensitization and habituation occur due to synaptic plasticity. Habituation due to synaptic depression and the connection between sensory and motor neurons. Sensitization due to synaptic facilitation and the connection between these mo neurons as well. Perceptual learning involves refinement of cortical representation of sensory inputs, with cortical plasticity seeming to reflect a Hebbian-like competitive process. And I didn't talk about hippocampus and place cells, but you can find more of that in the textbook. Um, let me talk here about one of the things that can happen about from a clinical perspective is how a habituation can go awry. So if you have a stroke, you disrupted brain flow, brain areas can be damaged, um, then you stop using a certain area. And the more you stop using it, it becomes habituation. The more these circuits and cells um, start, stop uh, um, losing control. So the idea is that if I lose my hand, you know, so just almost like a metaphor, you know, the, the musician doesn't lose his hand, he just doesn't use it as much. But imagine I have a stroke that stops me from losing my hand. Well, the same thing that's going to happen to a stroke victim it will be an extreme version of what happens to a, you know, a bass player who doesn't use his fingers so much so he loses some of the neuron sensitivity there relative to this hand. If you don't use this arm at all, then the parts of the brain, the sensory motor cortex, that were getting information from the hand will begin to sort of die off entirely. So the point is that although you may start with the physical s damage, a, a, par a stroke that prevents the physical movement, this process of, of, of competition, this sort of uh, uh, this evolutionary you know, um, competition that goes on in the brain for cells means that you'll lose the motor, that, that the stroke that initially caused physical damage will result in a cascade of changes that may actually make it worse, that sort of creates permanent. And so one of the ways that this has been addressed is through something called constraint-induced therapy. So the, people understand that there are two different problems. There's the loss of the physical loss of the hand, and then there's the loss of the brain circuits. So the problem is sometimes what will happen is a stroke causes the loss of the motor hand. You stop using it. The parts of the sensory brain that respond to it begin to habituate and atrophy off and the cells get bought, used by somebody else. And then when the hand eventually recovers, um, you can never use it again because the brain cells that were, it was communicating to have gone off to do something else or they've died off. So that's the principle behind constraint therapy. ago we showed you a treatment for stroke patients requiring them to use a special brace on the hand that was weakened by a stroke. Today another therapy. This one is for those who have some movement already but not much and want more. Reva Bauman had a stroke about four years ago. I could just you know minimally move my left arm I grossly not not fine hand movement or anything. Here's a look at Reva just trying to pick up a sandwich. Impossible for her to do alone. Weeks ago she could only eat with the help of her occupational therapist. <clears throat> Picking up these dominoes also extremely difficult. But Reva was determined to have a normal life and body again. So she joined an intensive therapy program at the Advanced Recovery Rehabilitation Center in Sherman Oaks. It's called Constraint Induced Movement Therapy. They put a constraining knit on the affected side so that they force movement with the affected side and it's very intensive repeated movements over and over again they get more and more signals going to the hand from the brain but the recovery really takes place in the brain the therapy lasts two to three weeks patients come in five days a week for six hours again never being allowed to use the dominant arm but only the weakened one Six hours a day, too, that's a long time. That's a lot, but it's worth every bit of it. And here's why. After just three weeks of therapy, Reva has use of her arm again. She has isolated movement of her uh, fingers now, so she can pick up small pegs, and we play Chinese checkers. And today is her last day of therapy. How are things now? Oh, much better. I can feed myself from my sandwiches. I can eat my dinner with a fork. Her improvement, dramatic and not uncommon. We have had um, people come in that have a little bit of movement to begin with and with that movement we're able to make the arm and the hand functional for them. They're able to dress themselves, they're able to uh, cook and food and prepare food and eat the food. Oh I think it's wonderful.
Yeah, it really is. For more information on this treatment, you can call 818-386-1231. Again, that number is 818-386-1231. In the future, the center plans on adding another therapy treatment for people whose legs have been affected by stroke. Again, that affects so many people out there in this country. Uh, but this therapy is tremendous. It gives them it gives them so much more independence. She can actually eat with both hands yeah. now, or certainly that affected one. That'd be a great feeling for her. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thank gentlemen. So, just to repeat, so in, in constraint-induced movement therapy, the good limb is restrained. So why, why is the good limb restrained? It's not really right, so the idea is really to force you to use, use it um, and, and not rely on. Um, we often see the same thing. You know, sometimes you get like a, a problem in one leg, so you start favoring the other leg, and then eventually it sort of gets even worse and worse because it's, you know, it's your attempt to, to adjust and, and to not use the injured thing which causes problem. Um, and it gives a chance for the, da the damaged limb to improve behavioral performance, and this just sort of shows some of the data um, on use. So in summary, in stroke, learned non-use occurs within the brain. So this is sort of habituation gone awry. You know, you're habituating things that you actually don't want to habituate. And so this constraint-induced movement therapy is a way of, of preventing that habituation while the, the physical damage can be repaired. Okay. So let me just briefly review what were the objectives that you should know, you should be able to come away with from today's lecture and from reading the textbook. You should be able to define and describe the processes of habituation and sensitization, describe the behavioral responses used to describe both, the factors that influence the rate and dur duration of habituation. Um, you should understand something about some of these theories, which I didn't cover here, but are in the textbook. Um, describe the different types of perceptual learning and several of the methods that have been used to study it. You should be able to describe the neural circuits of aplesia, as in sketch them out, um, describe the organization of the visual auditory sensory cortices, and something about how perceptual learning occurs, and what are these principles of Hebbian learning that underlie cortical changes. Um, and the hippocampal spatial learning story is all in the textbook. Um, we didn't talk about cochlear implants, you can just forget about that. We should be able to understand the processes behind stroke rehabilitation. Okay. So now we're going to have an end of class quiz for sort of immediate retention, which will also be a chance to review. So if everybody wants to take this. Mohammed, did you get the original quizzes from?